so here's a little footage of the progress we're making. Uh, electricians have got most of our new boxes in and wired for the coffee making machines and all the other items. We're going to be punching a hole in that wall right there pretty soon. We've already uh, doored this area off now so the coffee shop can exist. We'll put a second door in there for uh, the bathroom area, which is back in there. So we're slowly making the progress that needs to be made on the coffee shop. So it's exciting that we're finally making the progress on uh, the room itself. I got a plumber coming in today to order parts for the installation, which will happen towards the end of the month, I'm guessing. Uh, we're waiting for the state review on the plumbing plan. So it's just a time process at this point, but uh, it's so exciting seeing it all come together. Hope you all enjoyed me and the wife's uh, trip to Chicago together with us. It's a lot of fun. It's a great city. I always find some great music up there. So many great record stores. I'm not even familiar with a lot of them. Because they end up going to the same ones all the time. Because you build relationships and all that. But uh, today I want to weigh in on something real quick. The MoFi controversy. Uh, as I guess, what else can you call it? The uh, Those of you, I'm sure everyone knows at this point, I would think in the vinyl community. The, one of the most prestigious hi-fi uh, audio file pressing companies, MoFi. It was revealed, uses the digital process as a part of the process on a lot of their records since what, 10, 2013 or something like that. And <clears throat> I've never made a big point of caring too much about any of this stuff, as you all know. And uh, I've had a chance to buy many records over the years and the MoFi might have been an option but I never wanted to pay that extra 20 bucks or whatever it was for what I always felt was a minimal difference and I'm sure part of that's due to the equipment I play through I play through PA systems for the most part most of my setups over the years especially the last 10 years have been house PA systems that replicate the sound I'm going to get in the bar and uh, just run my, my work, my DJ tables through, um, you know, something that's going to be close to what I'm going to be experiencing when I'm at work. I think I have three PA sets, three sets of turntables. And so with three various different PA sets and many different ones over the years, I just find the difference in pressings is so minimal. And over DJing for 20 years, and having played Scorpio pressings and classic record pressings and original pressings of Blue Notes, for example, never once has anybody come up to me in the in the club setting, in the bar setting, in, in the lounge setting, and said this record sounds inferior. Never, not once. It's it's just so over exaggerated in my mind. The gap between various pressings. Not to say there's not some that sound kind of vacuous. Uh, my biggest pet peeve is when a, when a pressing sounds too quiet. Uh, I mean, that to me as a DJ is a, is a bigger issue. If I'm flip, flipping from one record to another, and this one's levels are so much lower, that you have to spike your mains and your mids just to try to boost it to match your signal on the other side. I would say that's my complaint with any pressings I've ever bought that were new was low volume. Uh, I mean, if you have a really high expensive PA amp system with analog tubes and the whole deal, which I've had friends in the, over the years who've really gotten into that, I'm sure they'll notice the, the differences are more perceptible. But I do think it's still really overstated. And this MoFi controversy kind of exposes a lot of the hypocrisy and phony baloney haughtiness. Uh, <clears throat> the the pompous, pious, oh, you're listening to a doxy pressing, it's digital, how dare you? It's so inferior. 
and these guys were listening to stuff that had uh, digital as part of the process and then didn't even notice. I mean, it's like sneaking cilantro by me. I hate cilantro. I've never liked it. It's never tasted but like anything but a bar of Irish spring soap to me. You can't sneak it by me. I might be able to tolerate it in some small dosages on something I'm eating, but you can't. I'm going to taste it. I'm going to hear it. And if you sneak enough of something by me, in spite of my protestations to the obvious that I can't stand it, but I didn't even notice it, it's got to be pretty imperceptible. And I think that's what, you, what the takeaway has to be. And for a lot of us who are being lambasted by the audiophile community, y'all didn't notice. I mean, y'all didn't notice. Y'all listened to some digital ass vinyl sourced with a digital process. And you sat there boasting and, and criticizing and being critical of so many others who didn't care to bear that expense, didn't deem it necessary. And it's not to say like a Crosley target turntable is going to be a great option. It's not, you know, uh, but to spend $10,000 on a system is also unnecessary unless, A, you got that income and that's not an issue for you. And on some level, it becomes a separate hobby in entirety. And I think that's part of what I think the issue is, is that for a lot of audiophiles, speakers and gear is more the point of what they're about and doing than the music or collecting the music. The music is just a vehicle to hear their systems, not to understand what the music has to say or where it's coming from. Uh, I've had guitar players in my bands over the years who would rather flip switches and knobs on amps and gear and outboard racks for hours than actually play and, 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 and jam. And often those guys are not the greatest players. And then there's the best players to me are usually the guy who shows up with a small little combo guitar amp, plugs it in, little thing, and he gets the best sounds and tones because he knows that he just wants to play. And that's all he does is play. And some of the guys just play with their gear. And I think that's the same kind of thing here where some guys want to play with their gear and be twi changing out tubes and updating amps and, uh, you know, just doing everything they can to silence the room. And sometimes they just don't play. They just don't learn to play. And I'd rather play with the guy that just wants to bring a little amp in and jam. Let's just throw it down. You know what I mean? So it's, again, it's not a subject I feel too passionate about. You know? But I've had a number of people say, hey, dude, why don't you weigh in on that? And I kind of was keeping my head out of it. But it's been a, what, almost a month now probably since that news broke. And so enough people said, what's your two cents on the subject? I think most of them kind of knew where I was going to come in on that. But for every pompous jackass who I've seen rip some newbie for buying a Dole, a Doxy, a Wax Time, uh, a Scorpio, for every one of them, and they're never polite about it. They're always just indignant. You know, and that's, all, that's what turned me off them so much was just how, oh my God, can't we buy And you ended up being fooled yourself. And it's not to say that the, 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 it's an industry-wide thing. It's obviously not. You know, and I'm sure a lot of audiophile pressings are sourced straight from the analog tapes and uh, as they should be if they're advertised that way. Uh, MoFi records do sound great in spite of that process. And I think that's another takeaway here is that it's a, still a way to get a great sound. You're not talking about an eight track and uh, just low fidelity. You can still do digitally sourced vinyl with that being part of the process. And, and from my understanding, I read a little bit about it. It was just a part of the process. You know, I don't think it was a straight digitally sourced like some labels are. So I do want to quantify that. But all the same, I just feel like a lot of these indignant jerks owe the world an apology at some point. Because you turn some people off of records, you turn some people off of jazz, you turn some people off of posting on, you know, the Facebook groups with your overzealousness. That's the most kind way I can say it. And I think a lot of them mean well, and they're trying to steer people towards a great sounding system. And uh, 
part of that's also they want to talk about their system. I like to talk about my records. Nothing wrong with that. But again, it's just that judgment of others and not allowing them to have their own process. I mean, if those people want to get into audiophile and want to get the expensive gear, they will. They'll get there themselves. There's plenty of channels, plenty of council and magazines. And, and I mean, it's, it's a pretty ubiquitous thing. It's almost hard to escape when you start delving into the vinyl realm. But like I said, I've always found it to be a little bit overbearing, somewhat nonsensical. I've always felt like the people who were heavy in the audiophile often missed talking about the music or what the music made them feel or any, all of that stuff. As, like, as, as I've explained many times. And so my two cents is just maybe some of y'all need to rein it in a little bit with your audiophile pomposity because y'all got played. Y'all got, you know, I mean, y'all got, got shook. The hustle hustler, the hustler hustled, you know, and y'all look like a bit of pompous jerk because you've been in that cilantro for weeks, months, years, and never said nothing. I don't remember hearing one audiophile saying, I have some suspicions about some of these mofi. I never, I don't remember ever hearing that. And so, as well tuned as our ears are supposedly supposed to be, I mean, and as obvious as the differences are supposed to be, how come not one of you said, hey, my audio thought pressing of this sounds like has digital involved in the process. Something's wrong here. But you never noticed because it didn't sound no damn different. It still came out sounding pretty darn impressive. So MoFi, I think, do what you do. Make your money, do, do what you do to keep it affordable for people, you know, and some things you have to just source the way you can source them to get them back out there on file. That's part of the deal nowadays. So, again, I'm not going to go any further with it. I do think it's kind of revealing. You know what I mean? I don't remember one of you piping up and saying, hey, something's wrong here. These, these sound inferior. My ears can hear digital all the time in an instant. And your fancy-ass sound system is not one of you. We're Sherlock Holmes enough to be like, oh, something's jacked up here. Uh, anyway, kudos uh, to the fellow who uh, discovered that. His name is escaping me right now. He's got the great channel. I think he's out of Arizona. Uh, you know, it took a little balls to come out and be, but I'm sure you got the views and the controversy has probably been great for his channel. Uh, I'm just over here sitting talking about history and music and, you know, getting my 500 to 1,000 views on an episode, which, again, I, I'd rather talk about what, what, where my heart's at than come fake with it and start talking about things I don't care about too much. And like I said, a lot, a lot of people wanted me to chime in on this subject, and probably a lot of them kind of already feel the way I feel. They wanted me to kind of help uh, say that message I'm guessing so there there it is I do want to mention a record I've been listening to the last couple of days and I have not had a lot of time to be listening to music lately well at least vinyl between the work going on down here with the dust I'm not playing records in the dusty conditions they've been drilling into the basement through concrete trying to get wires out of a box now the plumbers are going to be coming and doing the same thing uh, we've been we, we tore a couple walls up, put a couple doors in, drywall. It's just, it's been, there's been dust, my bottom line. And so, A, the lack of time. B, the room being kind of in a construction phase. has been a lot of time to listen to a lot of stuff. I'm not able to leave and listen to a lot of the new stuff I've gotten. I have been listening to this record a few times, and it's really a very enjoyable record. I can't tell you a lot about Doris Drew, if I'm honest. But uh, she's a nice little singer. And I think I showed this on one of my last episodes. But the, the band on here with Marty Peisch kind of arranging it, playing some Celeste in the piano, Fodger Quist on the trumpet, Herb Geller on the alto, Bobby Envilton on the valve trombone, Dave Bell on the Dave Pell on the tenor, Al Viola on the guitar was a great record on this mold label as well. With the great Max Bennett on the bass, one of the great kind of West Coast who ends up in the uh, wrecking group and plays on a lot of rock and rhythm and blues and country records. And then Mel Lewis, the great drummer. Uh, it's a fairly fantastic jazz group of some of the West Coast's best talent. 
And like I've said in numerous episodes, a singer is kind of at the mercy of the band she's playing with. And only the greats, like the Ella Fitzgeralds and the Louis Armstrongs, can find the blues in any setting. And some things are very hard to find the blues and let your soul speak over. Uh, Parker with strings, there's a, there's a guy that can play the blues over anything. You know, Armstrong could sing the blues over anything. And it's so funny now how many places I hear the blues. And it's something I think a lot of people kind of miss out on. Because they're, they're thinking of the blues so much in, in terms of that structure of the one four five. The, you know I mean? The, the, dun, 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 the basic blues that we hear in the movies. And, you know, uh, but the blues is a lot of things. And the blues is often the simple bending of a note that's not written on the page, that taking that liberty of imposing my feelings on a piece of music. And so rock and roll, R&B, a lot of those other jazz, they impose blues on music in very subtle ways sometimes that we don't really grasp or hear as the blues, but it's a blues phenomenon, it's a blues institution to extrapolate beyond the notes on the paper and to add a little fill or to, to bend the strings or to, you know I mean, throw a little vocal inflection. All those little expressions of self that are being an addition to the composition, that's coming from the blues. It's a, it's a black blues taking liberties with the art to express myself, to make it personal. That's the blues in so many ways. That's the essence of it. And so there's so many different compositions, uh, rock and roll, even country stuff. Where I'm just like, wow, he's borrowing from the language of the blues right there. Uh, David Gilmore, the great Pink Floyd guitar player, what a blues player he is. Uh, his tone is so rich and thick. And when he bends that string and then brings it back down, it seems so subtle and so simple, yet it takes a skill to do it well. And that feel that it creates is such a subtle, guttural feeling that we can, it it hits us. We can feel it in our gut. And that's the blues. A singer adding some gospel church, that's the blues. That's the black experience speaking over top of the composition. And I, it's just funny how often I can be listening to something that's not blues or jazz related and still hear that. It's really omnipresent. And so you listen to Chris Brown, the R&B singer. He's got a lot of the black church in him. You know what I mean? A lot of his little vocal trills and <clears throat> he's got a lot of Cab Calloway, James Brown in him. His dance steps, his showmanship, his facial expressions. A guy like Usher, the same thing, man. It's, it's really crazy. It's really crazy how much it's matriculated into the fabric of popular music and really goes uncredited so often. But it's a special part of how we connect with an artist. Uh, my brother listens to a lot of kind of country stuff that a lot of it I just don't connect with. You know, banjo to me is fun like cotton candy. Once in a while, it's great but I don't want to eat it every day. I don't want to listen to a banjo every day. <clears throat> he likes a lot of that kind of, you know, uh, trampled by turtles and uh, just that kind of new wave of America, Americana, but it's kind of modern versions of what the band did 40, 50 years ago in the 60s and 70s, you know. <clears throat> and it's funny how he doesn't even want to listen to the band, yet the band is so much the foundation for any rock with banjos and mandolins and kind of that traditional rootsy folk, roots bass, the basement tapes with Dylan. That's one of the funnest sessions of those white classic rock cats just kind of feeling and making rootsy music. It's a great record, great storytelling, a lot of blues in that. But he listens to uh, a few cats that are kind of modern, uh, just songwriters with country kind of edges to them 
but they borrow from the blues so much. And I kind of pointed out to him, I don't think he hears it or hears what I'm saying, but uh, it's, it's so omnipresent in so much of the music today. Rhythm and blues always filled with the blues. Obviously, the blues name is grafted in there for a reason. <clears throat> That's one of the things I really find fun, though, now, is just listening to this music and being like, wow, you can still hear where that guy got his riffs from. Eddie Van Halen has a lot of the blues in him. Slash from Guns N' Roses has a lot of blues in him. It's <clears throat> it's part of being a great guitar player, really. You know what I mean? And the gulf between an Engvi Malmsteen or a Steve Vai, who's a technically proficient in, uh, virtuoso. But those guys often are so technical that they stick to composition. They stick to the ego of my magnificence and lack sometimes the feeling that a more simple, basic guy like a Muddy Waters can just pull out of his horn, his guitar. And I love the rock and roll players that are just rooted. Uh, there's a cheesy metal band from the 80s called Cinderella that I liked a lot when I was 17, 18, 19. And Tom Kiefer, the singer slash lead guitar player, uh, he was actually the lead player. The rhythm player was the guy who didn't sing, which is kind of different. But he, he's a blues guy, man. He is just, he's so rooted in the blues. And listening to it now, I hear it so much differently than I did as a kid. I mean, they do a song that's an actual blues called Long Cold Winter. <clears throat> I think it's another one called Heartbreak Hotel, and those are like blues songs, so you know those are blues. But most of his other playing, most of his other singing, is so <clears throat> laced with that fabric, it's inescapable. ZZ Top is the blues. The blues is such a powerful force, and it's such a a way of expressing how I feel, ball, ball, bottom line. And that's what makes it so exciting and so valuable. You know what I mean? I'm not just bending the note to do so. I'm bending the note because it's kind of expressing how I feel. That little, blah, 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 that was a little, Zach Wilde, the guitar player. All of his little uh, ver, uh, tremolos and virtuosos and his little harmonics that he plucks in there. It's the blues. It's the blues, the blues, the blues all day long. And it's funny how much the fabric of American music is just standing on that pulpit. That black church, the blues foundation. It's so it's elemental to how we hear music, how we feel music. And yet, a lot of us don't make that connection whatsoever. So I'm going to leave that episode today as that. Uh, the MoFi thing, take it or leave it, you know. <clears throat> it's not a big deal. And I don't think you guys should be so critical of non-hi-fi uh, folks because uh, the differences are minimal. And y'all didn't even hear the differences yourselves. And I think that's pretty telling and kind of validates a lot of what I've been saying for years about it. And again, that's not even my primary issue with it. My primary issue is that you talk about a record that was released in that format and you go on for 20 minutes about it without talking about the music once. That, that's what bothers me. You're so focused on that one aspect of the record that you never talked about the record itself. As I've said many times, it's like having a Tom Sawyer book club. And all you're talking about is the paper and the ink and the book binding and the leather cover versus the paperback edition. And you never talk about the story. I'm like, I came here to talk about Huck Finn. You know what I mean? I came here to talk, <clears throat> talk about Tom Sawyer. And why are we just sitting talking about paper? So to sit there and talk about pressing for the entire time, it's certainly an aspect of collecting, but my God, it's not, it's not the be all end all of collecting. And if you want a record bad enough, you want the music, if you can find it used, buy it used. If you can find it, you know, as an expensive audio file, buy that. If you can find it only as <clears throat> a doxy dole pressing in the country that you live in or the region you live in for an affordable price, do that. Y'all be safe. Subscribe to the channel. Peace.